Good morning and welcome. It's a Monday morning and it is the seventh day in the month of November 2022. It's just always good to be a reminder. My name is Ayo Makende. Good morning and welcome. I'll never get over you <laughs> mentioning the dates. It looks like you're counting down to the end of the month. <laughs> But it's a beautiful Monday morning. Welcome to Lagos Nigeria's commercial capital. I'm Kyle Okikiyo. Well, you know, the last time some people remember um, the dates, right? You know, they were in primary school. You know, today's date is, and then they go on and on and oh, on. All right. So, uh, sometimes we don't. Some, you know, because we don't hear those things often. Sometimes we so it's back to school for you. Well, back to school for everyone. I'm, the, I'm the, just like force the teacher. <laughs> that's what that's back. Well, but you know, it's just another day in the life of those who have um, who are victims of the flooding Absolutely. that we have uh, have talked about, and they are also counting days. And you know, um, the governor of uh, Taraba State, for instance, was was uh, speaking in a conversation with the managing director of NEDC, who initially said, you know, they intend to get some interventions done and all and the governor is also talking about some relief materials already sent that's the governor of Taraba state the relief materials already sent to uh, the, the people who are suffering uh, this thing but he was more particular about farmers in the state and rightly so and, and you know the last time we we talked about this I mentioned the fact that there is an aspect of intervention that we are not talking about and that is the mental health of those who have been victims of this he in the governor was talking yesterday in, the, in that at that meeting i was talking about somebody who he was told said he had sunk 40 million naira into his rice farm and guess what the fellow is saying he wants to commit suicide because all of his farmlands have sunk now that if that is not grievous, I don't know what else is, and that is just one of several states. And according to the governor, that's the only one we know for now. How many other people are contemplating such a thing? How much intervention can we can we even do to get to the place where we say these people are mentally stable and can handle whatever else is coming? Uh, it, it is troubling. It's a Monday morning, but then hey. The issues are not just going to go away simply because we don't want to talk about them. Absolutely. And um, I mean, the figures are out there. I don't even think we have a full picture. There's a humanitarian crisis. There's an economic crisis that we have on our hands. And then, of course, you know the ripple effect. Yes, we know that Adamawa Taraba, they border Cameroon. But incidentally, the Minister of Water Resources has said just 1% of the flooding we've seen is from Cameroon. I, I know there's, the, there's also plans to have like a, a comprehensive you know, the flood mitigation plan and all of that. I know that they, they just recently in court, inaugurated that committee and they have less than 90 days to come up with that. That's futuristic. Hmm. Okay. And as you said, it's very important to talk about now. Uh, I mean, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, having experienced floods, it's not pretty. You realize that the difficult days are, I mean, the days you have to move away, you are displaced. But even the more difficult days are the days after, mm. where you have to pick up your life. You know, when the flood comes, first thing is survival. Okay, fight or flight response. You just want to move and get some place to rest. It's very traumatizing. It's very, uh, you know, tricky. But then afterwards, when the floods begin to recede, and then it dawns on you that, I have to maybe resume life, or, I mean, or some semblance of it. Those are the most difficult days. Now, these are farmers, as you mm. said, people have sunk in. I, and you know that there was that push. Let us go into agriculture. We need to feed the nation naturally. Yeah. So a lot of people, actually, I know people who personally said, you know what, it looks like this is a good thing. Yeah. I'm feeding the nation. Mm. We're contributing to diversifying our economy. It's a no-brainer. I mean, there was a lot of support. So they essentially, some borrowed money, some pieced money together, their mm. savings. Some did cooperative, essentially trying to focus on this. You know, we've talked about food insecurity yeah. a, a lot of times. So people went into this. So imagine you work in, a, in an office you have a business right and then flood comes and literally wipes that business away right in your face as in wipes it away so what do these people what will they go back to i know that there are talks about you know giving them relief materials and all of that but really with all of the millions these people have sunk in 
we have to definitely do better. I know there are questions about whether or not they had insurance. These conversations are important, really, to ensure that we, we mitigate the future. But these are the most difficult times. And I think it's good that you are hammering on this uh, you know, psychosocial support, this psychological intervention for these people. Because, as I said, it is like having a business you have built up to a certain level. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you're expecting returns. You know, there's that period where you don't make profit, right? Because mm -hmm. you're, you're sowing into it, you're plowing everything back into it, literally like farming. Yeah. And then you expect that, okay, there'll be harvesting season and all of these, you know, the sacrifice and all of that will pay off. And then here we are. It, it is... It is sad to say the least, but we'll keep talking about this because that is a reality of what the minister says over one million Nigerians affected right now. Yeah. We have hundreds dead. And as I said, I don't think we have a handle on the figure just yet. So we'll keep talking about this because we need to do right by these people who really, it's, it's no fault of theirs. So <clears throat> I think that this, would, this would naturally be a call on, on the authorities, particularly if we, we dare say the minist Federal Ministry of uh, disaster management i want to believe that this is part of yeah. you know something under their turf as well as the ministry of federal ministry of health and even at the state levels as well well it is health here and mental health is health mm. so I, I want to believe that you know this information is not lost on the authorities so that we can get the right intervention for the people because at the end of the day and then hey for now it seems they're only talking about the parents the guardians how about the children the way their lives have been toggled and all of that. Schools that have been ravaged by this flooding is that those schools are, needless to say, right now not working. The teachers, the, the banks, the organizations that have uh, been ravaged by this flooding, hey, those people at this very moment don't have jobs, may not have jobs for whatever number of days the flooding is going on, their personal economies, and their family economies, all those things are on hold, so to speak. So have we really thought about the entire, should I say, value chain that have been affected by this flooding in the number of states, more than 20 states we hear, and have we really sat down to factor in all of these things? I think it is very, very important. There is also that issue that we talk about from time to time, conversation between the federal government and the state governments. It is very, very important at this time because uh, in a situation where the state has one figure and the federal government has one figure, I don't think it is going to help in the entire value chain, in the entire conversation of these things that we're talking about. So very, very important for us while we're talking, as you said, Kaori, about the uh, economic considerations, economic implications, it is important for these people to be alive and well enough the security and welfare of citizens are the primary responsibilities of government. We'll take a short break now, and when we're back, it's time for look, to take a look at the papers. Stay with us.
When you hear that sound, you know it is time to take a look at the front pages. It's a Monday morning, so let's help you get a sense of what's going on around the country. We start off with the Daily Trust newspaper, and this is what you see on the front page. There you go. Civil servants engage in menial jobs to feed families. You, you, you read that right. And this is about cost of living crisis. That's the lead for the Daily Trust. Civil servants engage in menial jobs to feed families. Lots of questions just running through my mind, racing through my mind. Too many questions, but let's take the writers. Perhaps, maybe, we can answer some of those questions. Work as caterers, tricycle riders after work. Wow. See, boost production to lower inflation economy. So, civil servants, as I said, who are in paid employment, work, what is it, eight to four or nine to five? It's eight to four, I imagine. So they finish all of that work, and I mean, this report says they now resume another work just to feed their families. So what happens to what they earn? The cost of living issues, inflation, I mean, you know, what you could <coughs> purchase for maybe a hundred naira some years back, in fact, months back, some would say, has now since doubled. So you, you know, need to double your hustle, as they say. So to speak, yeah. And, you know, before some people start saying, hey, don't they do um, multiple jobs in other climbs? Yes, true. But the systems in, the, in those other climbs are not the same as ours. I mean, how much do they earn per hour in other climbs? Exactly. If you so, want to all just compare, let's <laughs> compare everything. <that's> cool. <laughs> you know, um, you talk about multiple, um, you know, costs doubling. Yeah. Um, I was in a meeting on Saturday when one CEO was saying, look, we're buying uh, diesel for something in the region of 350, 250 or thereabouts, some... Uh, as, as a January, mm. but now diesel is going for about say 800, 900. 250 as a January? No, but I think maybe 350 or thereabout. That's what this fellow said. I wanted to, <coughs> I wanted to find out who their dealer is. <laughs> you know, but that now, maybe, you know, if you buy in, vol in volumes from certain people, there could be those considerations, you know, for you know volume purchase. At least that's what the understanding is. So if that is the case, and the figures have multiplied, so to speak. I guess the reality is right in our faces. Right there in our faces. In fact, it's so much in our faces that the Daily Trust leads with this, just again, right there in our faces. So that's the big story for the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. I imagine it's the story for a lot of Nigerians. I mean, let's know how you're handling this situation, for lack of a better term, really. I mean, not everyone will be a civil servant. Some people are outrightly even unemployed, some underemployed, some employed to a certain level in the private sector, some entrepreneurs, some you know, small businesses, micro, nano, all of that. Huh? <laughs> and then nano business. I didn't know they were nano business. Well, you got that one. <laughs> Put that in the vocabulary. But let's know. I mean, how are you dealing with the inflation, the cost of living issues? Let's know. Send us a mail. Tweet at us at Sunrise Daily now. Would love to hear and, of course, share your experience with Nigerians. A couple of more stories on the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper. You see, insecurity bring in mercenaries, create a border patrol force. Report advises FG. Again, this talk. Uh, about mercenaries comes up. It's a page three read, and you see Kano APC crisis intrigues as Kwankwaso woos Dogua to NNPP. So I'll just reiterate yes, you saw that right. Dogua, <laughs> that's the um, well, that's that's a, a top official in the House of Representatives, mm. and um, there you see, isn't that the majority leader or yeah. something? I just okay. top official. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only the cut out of the bag too much, but hey, there you go. <laughs> Whoa, that's a Daily Trust newspaper for you this morning. Well, you talked about civil servants earlier. Well, let's say, is this another set of civil servants on the front page of this Nigeria newspaper? And uh, what you have is something that we should begin to give concern to now, attention to now. That's it. ASU plans to return to trenches. Well, you saw it over the weekend. If you haven't, well, the riders give you an indication as lecturers fume over October half salary. Paying lecturers half salaries unlawful, Serap tells Buhari. Conwa protest, no work, no pay policy. Uh oh. I thought that's the new kid on the block. Conwa. Mm -hmm. Right? They are protesting no work, no pay policy. Already. Oh, I see. Um, and the government said this is not no work, no pay oh. per se. 
Well, this is no work, no pay, not um, on just payments, just to be mm. clear, because okay. there was a statement put out saying, well, they naturally will pay for the days the work. people work for, but then you know, naturally questions will abound, really, after all of this. But you know what? It, it's, 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 it's a major one, really. Anyway, Palanos Buhari, Ignong Gige, pay as members full February to October salaries. That story is on page two. I mean, we're not, are we new to labor, you know, issues such that you say, uh, okay, you won't go to work? I don't, anyway, I don't know. That's the lead story. Uh, the, the details you'll find on page two. And if you want to react, please let us know what you think. Should ASU return to the trenches, what happens? Right under the picture on the front page, Nigeria deserves permanent seat in UN Security Council, says Buhari's chief of staff. Find that story on page four of the paper this morning. That's this Nigeria today. All right, our next paper is coming from Abuja. Good morning, Mark. Hello, Kade. How are you doing this morning? Well, good morning, Nigerians, and welcome to the Federal Capital Territory. Take a look at what the Abuja Inquirer has for you on the front page this morning. Obi Okowa, Kwankwanso Spa at Town Hall. Well, that's the lead story. I'm monitoring one of the many town halls that will be going on um, in this season. Obedience, protest against Okowa, NNPP plans one million army. We are selling trusts, that's according to Labour Party. We offer something different, uh, that's from PRP. So you have quite a number of riders, all of them from the town hall yesterday. Uh, look at this, how demolition squad escaped lynching in Abuja. Yeah, there's been some demolition going on in different parts of the capital territory, uh, trying to restore sanity to you know areas that have been built improperly or areas that are not supposed to be uh, seen instead of buildings that we're seeing or where shanties are taking over uh, looks like that squad the demolition squad you know came against uh, an angry mob uh, maybe over the weekend but the fcta says this they vowed to return with full force well let us hope that uh, you know it's done peacefully, not in a way that involves any bloodshed, but in a way that you know people get the message that it needs to be structure, law, and order, especially in a place like the federal capital territory. Page eleven is where you get details. You also have on top of the nameplate, federal government to continue Niger Delta amnesty program. This gives us enough time to work. That's from Barry Indiomo, who is the new guy at the helm of affairs. Page three is where you'll find details. Let's leave it there for the Abuja Inquirer. And turn our attention to Vanguard newspaper this morning with this one. FG pushing manufacturers, others out of existence. That's according to Man, Neka, Nasima, others. And um, you understand that these are bodies of manufacturers, particularly good writers. Reject planned increase in excise duty for food, beverages, others say over 17 bills pending at National Assembly to impose levies on businesses. What? They're pending bills. They're not <laughs> acts yet. And um, the should government they, will tell you. Should they even be considered at well, all? The government will tell you we have a revenue crunch. We need to raise money. And uh, Federal, state and local government levels. Do you know how many? Some of them say they have something in between 50 and 200 and something taxes, levies, whatever it is. So, there you go. I mean, you have your representative. I mean, this is why it's important to engage government. If you think that some of these laws might stifle business, I mean, raise your voice. Speak to your representatives. Right? That's, they're there for you. And a couple of other writers actually tell the story. I'll, I'll let you do the picking. And there, there's an infographic right there on the front page. EEG. Uh, in case you're wondering what the EEG means, it's not electroencephalography. Ah. I thought that was what it was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the Export and Expansion Grant. and talks about indigenous exporters' alleged inclusion in favor of expatriates. So that's another one that we need to get some more clarity on uh, this morning. Uh, just under that infographic, you see transmission, upload of results, political parties, CSOs tackle line over public view of polling results. It's a page seven read. So you wonder what kind of tackling 
is this one on which side is this taco well you might find more details on page seven it's actually a full page on the front page of the vanguard uh this morning you see nav airstrikes kill i swap commanders ali choir booker mainoka others so that's a win in the theater of war you might say and then mr and mrs of course but before that there's sports on the back page arsenal edge chelsea go top of premier league uh, saying it's nothing personal you might get that joke if you've been following the trend but mr and mrs this morning you see mr saying some people say i'm not taking care of my wife with an exclamation mark it's probably befuddled this morning mrs looking very dashing in that red outfit says to her husband don't mind them dear i'm a living testimony and testimony means testing the money <laughs> Add that to your dictionary. <laughs> Testing the money. That's Mrs. Rather. That's the vanguard <laughs> for you this morning. Okay. I'm going to let Mapoy respond to that later. Well, let's she has a testimony, right? <laughs> okay. Leadership newspaper has this one on its front page. And it's talking about political parties. In breach of electoral act, Annex shields political parties over unaudited accounts. Wow. The story is on page four. And of course, um, there are four points at issue right there on the front page, right under the, the major story. You'll find the details on page four of the paper this morning. Right under the nameplate, private sector operators decry incessant summons by NAS. Incessant summons by NAS. You want to find out exactly what makes that be. The details continue on page 7 of the leadership newspaper this morning. And uh, right above the nameplate, students warn against another ASU strike as union meets today. Hmm. That story is on page 7. Well, clearly we don't need to go far to know exactly what the students think. That's the leadership newspaper this morning. Okay. Well, take a look at what New Telegraph has for you. 2023, name calling takes the shine of presidential campaigns as PDP, APC continue to fight dirty. We're ready for drug tests. That's according to Kayamo. Tenobu Atiku absent as Obi Kwankwanso attend town hall meeting. Wike Ikbazu Makinde Ugwanyi storm Benue for PDP. Guba campaign flag of today. Lalong inaugurates APC, APC's 14-man campaign committee. So you find all of the political details on pages 5, 9, 10, 11, 25, 28, and 29. Well, a lot of pages, uh, but I, I imagine it will be certainly worth your read. Property, ICPC commences forfeited assets disposal process set to track 712 constituency projects in 20 states. Asset forfeiture, Ohanese accuses federal government of complicity in Ekwerimadu's UK ordeal, says it's South's turn to head EFCC. Okay, uh, pages three and four will fill you in on that. Uh, you also find the number of stories just on top of the nameplate Nigeria deserves permanent seat in UN Security Council, says Gambari. TBN, petroleum product import, gulped 3.75 trillion naira in the first half of 2022. Okowa to youth, fill Delta's army recruitment quota. It looks like Delta State is not meeting its own army recruitment quota. ASU, Serap threatens legal action over half salaries payment to lecturers. So that is also going on um, on pages three and four of the paper for you. Let's leave it there for New Telegraph. Vanguard, I took earlier. It's Guardian and I'm taking now. COP27, oh, yeah, this paper can just play a trick on you. It's a Guardian now, COP27. Inflation, energy security, first trade commitments to climate change. That's how the Guardian leads this morning. Nigeria, others push for more oil exploration. That's right. 
UN will hold world leaders accountable. So it's a focus on COP27 this time around in Egypt. It's the African countries most affected by climate change, says COP27 president. World's green agenda undermines Africa's priorities, says Ayukam. And I know it's a very tricky one for, for nations right now. I mean, they have to battle inflation, economic crisis, and there's a call now for more responsible energy use, if I could just couch it in mm. that. And, and then they have to meet these needs. They have citizens that are clamoring for, you know, better economic realities. So, it's a very delicate balance, really. Yeah, while, while, while you're right, it's a very delicate balance. Collaboration, I think, is going to, you know, really help. African countries, African heads of governments need to come together and chart a course for the continent. What did Europe do? Europe sat down together and decided, okay, this is the direction we want to go. Even the regions, I'm not even sure that the regions themselves are able to sit down together and agree on something. So that collaboration is necessary. Don't forget, Goal 17 talks about partnerships. Well, we've tried that. We're trying that with AFTA. <laughs> so let's see what happens in the days after. Uh, <laughs> after, after, or what? Yeah, after, after. <laughs> well, there's this one in red. The real scorecard of President Buhari. And um, you might want to I read about that, page 16 of the Guardian newspaper. It's, it's a lot of other stories. It's, it's a big news day, big news week, if you say. That's the Guardian newspaper. The Daily Times newspaper is leading with a promise from the chief of staff to the president. Buhari will leave Nigeria more prosperous, secure than he met it. That's ascribed to Gambari, the COS, says president will leave legacies of credible elections, massive infrastructure. And then there is a story there uh, in parenthesis, Nigeria deserves permanent seat in UN Security Council, since we've been talking about that for a bit. And right under the picture on the front page, 2023, Tinubu article absent and town hall for presidential candidates. Obi Kwakwaso Kolabiola attend, speak on agenda. Okowa stands in for PDP's flag bearer. And then there is a, another one there. Why we did not attend town hall meeting, Tinubu Shetima. Find the details on, continue on the inside pages. NGF urges urgent action to tackle brain drain. So, who is the NGF urging? The governors, or I don't know. That story is on page two. All right. Um, well, that's that question is in the air. Actually, you aren't asking me clearly, but you know that's a look at the daily. It's quite interesting <laughs> stories. Uh, but we'll take a moment now. When we return, we'll start off with the major issues. You know how you're facing challenges: the economy, security, and all of that. And you're wondering who can solve these issues. Well, we'll take them to task in a moment. So, grab a cup of coffee, whatever works for you coffee and we'll be back in a moment stay with us Okay, so we're talking politics. It starts on Monday morning. I'm sure you have been following the dailies and what they have to say about, you know, what has been going on 
um, in the polity. There was a town hall yesterday and a lot of the dailies followed that. In fact, New Telegraph says name calling takes the shine of presidential campaigns. Uh, for a number of people, yes, a lot, of, a lot of people want the politicians to focus on uh, the issues for 2023. Um, and a lot of that doesn't focus on, um, you know, the sh on, on sentiment more or less. But can we really do politics without sentiment? Is, is it really possible? Because some people say politics is an emotional venture and that people oftentimes vote emotionally. Um, recently, there was a statement attributed to Senator Dino Melae, who, who said uh, that there is no way that the Labour Party candidate can win because he's a regional candidate. But the Labour Party has swiftly countered that. Uh, but for those who are watching the polity, whether or not they'll vote, the number of analysts are saying these elections are most likely going to be regional. Is it possible that we'll be able to avoid that? Well, I have two gentlemen here with me this morning. Mr. Elimona Onoja is a member of the People's Democratic Party. It's good to see you. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Malpa. And we also have with us Mr. Chris Wonkobia Jr., who is a member of the OB Dati Presidential Campaign Council. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily once again. The pleasure is profoundly mine. Yeah, so we have been talking. I mean, only on Friday I had a discussion with... Uh, the DG of your presidential campaign council, he was very um, matter-of-factly in the conversation that I had with him. I do not know if you were able to see. You saw it. You saw it, okay. Um, and a number of things came up. Um, I was telling him about, because part of the controversy which we discussed was the controversy around the endorsement or otherwise um, of the party, the, the, the candidate of your party by Afeni Ferry, a Yoruba social political organization, and um, it just turns out that there was another endorsement, uh, or will I say, I, well, let's just call it endorsement for the sake of, um, can't find other words now. And um, that has created some controversy. Now, we saw what happened with Afeni Ferry. I asked him for a response to that. And he, you know, said that he doesn't think, uh, Yorubas have always been people who will vote either way. It doesn't matter, who, you know, who or not Afeni Ferry is endorsing. But he was quite, I mean, I was asking about the fact that your party, your candidate, has never been one to, you know, you know, say vote for me based on the fact that it is my turn. It, you know, it is the turn of the Southeast. Um, he's always talked about competence, et cetera, et cetera. But he said that there is no way that that is not going to come to play in this 2023 elections. How is your party preparing for the pragmatism of something that is most likely to come out to play in the 2023 elections? Mokma, let me say clearly that um, Afenifer has, uh, in no uncertain terms, said that there is no controversy and that they did not endorse the candidacy of Bola Ahmed Tinubu. They, uh, about two years ago, uh, the leadership devolved to uh, <clears throat> Pade Bajo. And Fasorati uh, said clearly that he was too old and he had handed over leadership. That what he just did was pray for the guests that came to see him in Ondo, that if P2B had come, he would still pray for him. If uh, Kwokwansu, for instance, had visited him, he would pray. Because I really don't want to man. visit this controversy no, no, let me, again. Let me, because... no, I'm, I'm putting it in perspective. Uh, yes. But for us, yes. in the Labour Party, and for the candidacy of Peter Gregory will be, it's about competency. He's the only candidate who has openly told Nigerians, do not vote for me because I'm Igbo. Vote for me on account of competency and capacity. Mm. So those who pander to ethnicity and ethnocentric sentiments are being unfair. Mm. Uh, and that's why I'm here. I, I totally They're disagree. They're being unfair? Being uh, unfair because some people will say that his Igboness is not the issue. Just a moment. Uh, some people will say that even the timing of his candidacy has been strategic. In 2019, he was on the ballot, but he was a vice presidential candidate to um, Vice President Atikwa Abubakar, former vice president, who was running as the candidate of the Labour of, bigger pardon, of the People's Democratic Party. He's still running as that now, uh, but they ran a joint ticket at that time. That's right. Wasn't it because at that time, the sentiments were also quite high that it, it was going to be between two northern candidates? Simply so. 
But let me tell you, passion, genuine passion, sincerity, and commitment to purpose is beyond ethnocentric sentiments. He came out and said, this is the time to refocus, refix, reshape, redefine our country. Mm -hmm. And it is for me beyond ethnicity, beyond religion, and beyond the tendencies that divide us. And I said this without fear of querulous critics and with commitment to truth, that the candidacy of Peter Gregory Obi is the only candidacy that resonates beyond religion and region. Mm. Let me come to you now. Um, <laughs> because I'm sure you must have listened, you know, I don't know why this controversy came up in the first instance, you know, or what Senator Dino Melae was responding to, but this is what, those were his words. And why, why do members of the PDP feel that their own candidate is not, the, is not um, a regional candidate, if they think that all the candidates are regional candidates? For a number of reasons, Malcolm. For one, the advocacy, the candidature of Alaja Atikobak has steeped in the sort of policy propositions that provide long-term lasting solutions to the challenges that have faced this country for almost all of its existence. And at the stage of our national history, of our national life where we are, where we're plagued by record insecurity, record um, inflation, record unemployment, record lack of access to education and all those or the matrix is, matrix, what you would realize that more than ever before, well, we, the country needs a committed advocate to the solutions that we've, to the problems, committed access, advocate to the problems, no, excuse me, committed advocate to the solutions that form the, uh, you know, that will resolve the problems that we have always faced. Now, <clears throat> our candidate is the candidate who has, over the course of his career, built a network that is, you know, transnational it cuts across the entire country our candidate is the our party is the party that has over the years built a network that cuts across the entire country the candidature the combination of the candidature and the structure of the party across the country lends the credence to the fact that undoubtedly he's the one who without appealing to these sorts of um um regional or religious sentiment. He's the one who focuses simply on what we believe we should be focused on, providing solutions and policy propositions that will resolve the challenges that face this country. Very simply put. There is no way that we can ignore the fact that our country is still very heavily regional or, will I say, ethnocentric in terms of how its politics is done. Uh, it, was, it, it was so heavy in the air that the PDP had to institutionalize it in its own constitution, that there needs to be a rotation uh, so that no area, no, no region feels left out. If you look at the pattern of his own emergence as well, would you say that he was able to sufficiently appeal to, will I say, a pan, uh, I'm looking for the right words now. Pan Nigerian. Yeah, a, a pan Nigerian I'm sentiment, very grateful even for within I'm very the grateful PDP for, itself. I'm very grateful for the question, Malcolm. If we must interrogate, and we must interrogate the zoning principle, right, we will discover a couple of, couple of things. In between 1999 and now, three regions of the country have never produced a president three regions of the country. They are the Northeast, the Southeast, and the North Central. Three regions have the Southwest, the South South, and the Northwest, with President Mohamed Buhari just completing his tenure. I think it appeals to the principle of zoning and the principle of um, rotation. If one person from any of these three regions produces a president, it appeals to that. If that is fair, that is just, that is equitable. If, and you know, I've heard the argument be said that the rotation is north versus south and not geopolitical reason, um, regions. I disagree. I disagree because if we do it north versus south and the objective is an inclusion of many pe as many people as possible, what happens to people, for instance, like me, from the north central is that we never get included simply because we don't have the numbers. What will happen to people from the um, southeast, for instance, 
said they will not get included simply because the numbers are not there. If we focus only on the regions of North and South, it will never happen that a person from Kogi State, for instance, will stand the chance of being president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. For that reason, when I mean, we have to, for that moment, reason... I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, you know, finish your thoughts, but I have to interrupt you because your, the constitution of your party did not talk about geopolitical zones. That's right. The constitution of our party spoke, spoke about, about North, ro North no, and South. No, the constitution of our party spoke about rotation. There's no specific mention about how that rotation should be done. Does it recognize geopolitical it, zones? Well, we've always recognized geopolitical zones since 1999. Always. Historically. That is the reason why you see the president will be from one geopolitical zone, the vice president from another geopolitical zone, the senate president from yet another ge geopolitical zone, the speaker of the house from yet another geopolitical zone, the secretary general. But in of, this instance, if you if you take all that yes. into consideration, our party has historically always spoken about geopolitical zones and implemented that in its zoning principles. So perhaps you have to take there that could into be a micro zoning, I mean, after the general or the broad acceptance, you know, about, you know, north versus south or north and south, as the case might be. Um, you know, when you now say, okay, it's going to the south, what part of the south? Uh, it's going to the north, what part of the north? These are the kind of questions that people will expect that you'll ask. But where it is convenient, because we all know that the country is not equally structured. Uh, the Southeast, for instance, has five states. The Northwest has seven states. And, and Kano alone has over 40 local government That's areas. Uh, yeah, when you have a Bielsa that has eight local government areas. So when you look at the fact that, you know, we're not structured in an even manner, uh, some, and if democracy is about numbers, some states will certainly have a bigger say than some other states will. Which is so, the reason yeah. why you have to use a zoning formula that is as granular as possible. Having taken into recognition all the numbers that you've just called, having taken into recognition everything that you've just said, yes. if you use the broad um, terms of North versus South, a person from Kanu or a person from Katsina or a person from Kebi will always have an advantage over a person from, say, Kogi, Plateau, or Benue. Isn't it's that, very, it's exactly. very, so hold it's, on. So, isn't that, isn't so, that what played out in the primaries how? of the PDP? Uh, how? Alaja Tukobaka is, is from the northeast, one. If we use your broad, um, your broad definition of north versus south, wouldn't have had a shot, one, two. Alaja Why wouldn't Baka, he have had a Alaja, shot? Because it was, if, if we use that, I mean, they're stronger. The more delegates from Kano State, for instance, yes. the and more we, delegates, and, and we took it, and we took it into Just consideration. We saw what happened towards the end of that uh, campaign of the, would I say, the primaries, where a northwestern candidate stood down for him and told people who would have ordinarily voted him. To vote for Alajia to go Abubakar. Which is can going we, to bring me. Can we to discountenance this. the effect of that? It, it, I mean, at some point, yeah. we have to take into consideration that there was politicking that went on. Mm. Agreements were reached this way, that way, or the other way. And you, you, I mean, you cannot avoid the fact that that will happen yeah. in political so what, circles. What, I, I think but the question I'm trying to ask is my it's not about. It's, yes, I keep interrupting you because I'm actually trying to. It's not about what I'm trying to bring out. It's not about the PDP primaries. What I'm trying to say, or what I'm, the question I'm trying to pose is, if you were to look at his emergence, um, can we really say that when you're not talking about regional candidates, or in terms of even how he himself emerged, can we discountenance how that is going to play out you know, within the larger electoral cycle in such a way that, um, in such a way that we can begin to preempt maybe what could most likely happen because people do fear that there could be deep divisions after the 2023 elections and that whoever takes the cake is going to have a job of work uniting all Nigerians it is behind the first that task. one party. It is speaker. the first task that anybody who wins the presidential ele elections in 2023 will have to embark on. It is the first task, which is the reason why our candidate is the only candidate who's committed to forming a government of national unity that doesn't take, that takes into consideration regional interests, that takes into consideration 
cross-party interests. And not only that, goes as far as saying that we're in a similar place in 2022, going into 2023, as we were in 1999, which formed the need, which formed the foundation of the, the policy of appointing people into the government of President Olusegun Obasanjo, who were not necessarily from the PDP stock, and who and, and ensuring that there was a broad spread of appointments and inclusion into the government. It is the reason why our candidate, as recently as yesterday, on his behalf, the vice president restated that commitment as recently as he's restated that committed that commitment by himself as recently as last week. Mm -hmm. Our candidate is the only person who is saying we recognize the tensions that the um, the current political season are putting up, and this is our plan for how to reunite the country My immediately that candidate, thereafter. That candidate is the first candidate in this political season who has pandered to regional sentiments. That candidate is the only candidate who basically had told Northerners that he is the one who should and who would represent Northern interest. That candidate is indeed the person whose mantra is about unifier, but he's a divider in chief. Yeah, but are that you, candidate... Are you, just a moment. Are you really taking... I mean, because I, I think I know the statement you're referring to. He is here. He's standing talking about the no, Philippines. Yes, but some, that. some people will say that, you know, are you also taking into cognizance the context in which he was speaking? Very well, uh, And the question to very, which, to very which well, he was responding. Let me say this. I am a student of semantics, and I proudly say so. When you look at the context, yes, I agreed that he was in the Northern Fora. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about a pan-Nigerian candidate, you should be talking about a nation in need, in dire need, of capacity over mm -hmm. ethnocentric sentiments, of competency over ethnocentric sentiments. And let me say clearly that the only candidate who has, in every thought and respect, can vast a pan-Nigerian ideal is Peter Gregory B. And Oftentimes, when I look at what people say, you know, the, the question is, why always will be? And I'll tell you, uh, when this flooding thing started, people wondered why he started his visits from the North Central and before he went to the South South and the South East. And the same people who accused him of being a regional candidate said, oh, why would you go to the North first? Why would you go to the South South? Why not Anambra State? He went to Anambra after he had visited the North and the South, and the South-South. Because simply, the, 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 the challenge of our nation is beyond the propriety of uh, ethnocentric sentiments. It's about empathy, passion, commitment, and love for a nation that, that desires a leader who cares, who has deep commitment to a progressive nation. And the only candidate in the amphitheater is Peter Gregory. And I say this. Uh, you know the candidate of the APC, you know the Emilokon phraseology, you know Atiku and how the North will need a Northern candidate who is pan-Nigerian. So I put it, because I, I, I'll boldly undertake that issue. And then you see other candidates who are talking about their ethnocentric and regional biases. But the only person who has come on our political kaleidoscope and said something very clear, he said, do not vote for me because I'm Igbo. Vote for me because of my competency and my capacity. Vote for me because of my passion and my understanding of the urgency of now. Yeah, but and can you really discount this when he says do not vote for me because part of the reason why his candidacy has, you know, for some people, apart resonates. from... Resonates. Yes, resonates. is also on the issue of justice and fairness, which is what a number of people... That's the lowest you know, on the ladder. You, you think so? Yes, I tell you. Let me tell you this. Nigerians are looking for a frugal leader who will put due process, financial discipline, over and above profligacy. Well, you, Nigerians you, are looking at you say competency a, and capacity just a moment, over a just a sentiments. You say that it is the lowest on the ladder. That's, yes, that's it. That's how for him that's how and for us. That's how you're looking at it. I mean, that is on the lowest on the ladder for you. For our party. Yes. For our candidate. But it is there. Oh, yes, it is. That's why Atiku will say what he said in the North. We are not yes. denying the fact that we have ethnocentric ten tendencies. We're not denying the fact that we have regional prejudices and biases. We're not denying the fact that some people are 
throwing up those issues. If you go to the southwest and you see the, the BAT campaign, they're talking about Yorubanes. If you go to the north and see the Atiku Abuaka campaign, they're talking about their Aosanes and their Fulaniness. The only candidate who's talking about our Nigerianness is Peter Gregory Obi, and that's because hunger is indiscriminate of your ethnicity, insecurity is indiscriminate of your religion, joblessness is indiscriminate of where you are from. We're looking at a country that works. We're looking at a country that is able to appropriate the amazing resources and riches in a fable that God Almighty has blessed our country with to, for progress. And the only candidate who looks at the Nigerian socio-political environment from that prison is Peter Gregory Obi, and that's the way to go. Uh, I think that the time has come for us to nudge the Nigerian electorate to look at the candidate who sees beyond your ethnicity, who sees beyond your religion, who sees all of us as one people, because we're caught together in a single network of mutuality. Mm. What affects one directly affects the other indirectly. The hunger in the space does not know whether you're Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, or the minorities. The joblessness in the space does not care about your ethnicity. The insecurity that, that, that tears us apart does not care whether you're Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, or the minorities. And the only candidate who thinks about competency and capacity going forward into 2023 is Peter Gregory Obi. Let me flip this conversation to... To Lagos now. I know my colleague have quest my colleagues have questions for you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. But it's quite an interesting conversation, especially when you weigh, uh, you know, the messaging. On the one hand, I mean, you cannot uh, remove entirely that ethnic consideration. In fact, both candidates represented here have a clamor, at least. There's been some sort of clamor. Mr. Nodja has spoken to that, saying, well, the Northeast has not had some sort of representation at that very top level. We've heard uh, a, a lot of uh, groups also supporting Mr. Abi based on the fact that they believe that for equity, fairness, and justice, it should go to the Southeast. But then uh, when it comes to you know, issues of competence and the voting proper, they will say that, well, we're pan-Nigerians. I don't know if that's uh, an irony in itself or they go hand in hand. But there's something I'd like both of you to speak to, which is something that was mentioned. And I think it's important uh, that we clear that out. And I'll start with Mr. Wokobia. And this is based uh, off that point on a government on national unity, a government of national unity uh, that was mentioned earlier. What does that mean? for your candidate, this government of national unity, operationalizing it, does it mean that if he becomes president, he will select candidates from other parties, or sorry, members of other parties, maybe frontline candidates, who be a part of the government, or people from those regions or zones to be part of the government? What exactly does this government of national unity mean for your candidates? With the greatest sense of commitment and seriousness, uh, Every candidate who truly cares about our country will be thinking and talking about the need for a government of national unity. It's not uh, restricted to any candidate because um, we have never been this divided. You know, uh, our country uh, is divided along its fault lines, religion and region. And so whoever emerges president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria come 2023, God willing, uh, uh, when Peter Gregory will be emerges the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He will address these issues. And so uh, the issues for uh, the con uh, constitution of a government of national unity becomes imperative. But let me say here, um, I listened to you, my brother, and you did talk about issues pertaining uh, equity, which so many people have talked about, and justice. My brother talked about the fact that uh, three regions, as it were, since 1993, uh, since 1999 has not produced a president, the South uh, East, the North Central, and indeed the North East. But if you now take it further, you find out that the North East has produced a vice president. The South East has not produced a vice president. The South East has not produced a president. So if you are looking at the Nigerian evolution and the need for brotherhood, the need for equity, the need for fairness, um, like Mokwe and yours sincerely have talked about. What is primarily important is to look the way of the Southeast. But that is not the linchpin. Mr. Okobia, to, to be fair and, and to be the clear, linchpin, really, 
we can never really finish with that conversation of equity, fairness, and justice. I know it's one that will maybe last up until even after the election, but this one is a part particularly about the government of national unity, uh, which I imagine your candidate mm. is, is, uh, is planning that. So I want to know what it means, what it means exactly. I'd like you to define it if you can. Does it mean you, that you, he you, will you bring have in to... people from other parties or just essentially have people Absolutely. from other regions? Nin Nigerians who care... It means including Nigerians who care, indiscriminate of political parties, indiscriminate of ethnicity, indiscriminate of religion, Nigerians who truly believe that we can collectively make our country better. Uh, President uh, Obasanjo did that in the beginning of the Fourth Republic. You remember Bola Ege was not of the PDP stock, but he brought him into government. And several other persons were co-opted at different levels of government. To move our country forward, we definitely must look at issues from that prism. And after the town hall meeting yesterday, at different levels within the Labour Party and uh, with our principal, it was clearly obvious that right. uh, a color viola, for instance, would be necessarily important in moving our country forward. Right. It sounded very uh, articulate, and he brought issues that are germane to moving our country forward. Okay. To the fore, uh, let uh, me take this. we saw the delivery and the erudition of Kwa Kwanso. There's several people that will bring into government when Peter Gregory will be in discriminant of political parties, in discriminant of region, in discriminant of the biases and the fault lines that well, hold our country, the country down. We will have a government. Well, Mr. Wokobi, I, I believe you meant to say all if, inclusive not and when. involving of Nigerians of different tendencies. Right, I believe you meant to say if he becomes president, not when, because the people essentially will go out there to, to, to make the decision. When he becomes eventually. president. Well, it has to be if, except you already have the results when uh, he of the election. President. He will win the election. Well, you don't have the results yet, and it's essentially an INEC purview, and the people. But I understand, I mean, the conversation, it's the political season. But let's go to uh, Mr. Onodja and get a sense, because I know you started uh, the conversation about government of national unity. He has talked about people that he'll possibly poach. He has mentioned some of them. What does this mean? for your candidates really this government of national unity because i believe that we need to have a nation really to govern and we've seen lots of fault lines being explored or exploited in recent times i will um respond to that by saying that only our candidates have spoken about it we're not going to assume it on the part of other candidates because they've as much as and i hear mr Mokobia say that it is so important and that everybody who cares about Nigeria should be speaking about it. Well, only one person is speaking about it, Alaji Atiku Abakar. What does it mean? It means that as much as possible, he will bring into governance, not just people from the People's Democratic Party, not just people from his side of the country, not just people of his faith and his religion, he will bring as much representation into government as possible to ensure that everybody across the country gets, or every as many demographics across the country get to play key roles, primarily in reuniting the country first and foremost, and then in ensuring that we are governed properly and adequately. If we are going to say that, um, and these are Mr. Nwakobia's words, only people who love Nigeria will be speaking about it. Then there's one person who has been speaking about it. We therefore have to take it into consideration that amongst the candidates is the one who is demonstrating the most love for the country. Because he's literally the only one who's speaking no, about it. He's about literally it the form. only one who's speaking about it. And if what, it, it's not just speaking about it. It's also in our party manifesto because there is a strong commitment, just as it was demonstrated by our party in 1999. There's a strong commitment to realizing that we've never been this divided, to realizing that we've never been this poor, to realizing that we've never been this unhappy as the Nigerian people, and that it is only a broad spectrum of the Nigerian people, regardless of party, regardless of tribe, regardless of religion, who are going to be able to work together to ensure that we can recover our country from the morals that the APC has led us into willy-nilly and ensure that we're firmly placed on a path to social, political and economic growth and development. It goes without saying. I'm, I'm just wondering... Um... Let me ask you if you think, if you think that the PDP is jittery, in the light of the conversation that held um, 
where one of the spokespersons of your party said that the candidate of the Labour Party is splitting the votes of the PDP and saying that, look, any vote for the other you know, uh, candidate is splitting the vote and favoring the other, the, the, another party completely irrespective of uh, whatever their leanings are. Is the PDP jittery? Jittery is not the word I would use. I don't, it's not the word I will use. The PDP is aware and is taking into consideration. If you look at electoral maps, you will see that. Um, and if you look, study social trends, you will see that a couple of people, there are a number of people who primarily used to vote for the PDP who say they will vote another way in this election. Jittery is not the word I will use. Um, consider it. PDP considers that fact and considers the potential outcome. However, we're also aware that given the positioning of our candidate as the one who is focused primarily on solutions to resolving Nigeria's socioeconomic problems and who is focused primarily again bring, to bringing people from across the country together to form a government if he wins the election. And I say if. If because, unless and until the Nigerian people exercise their constitutional right to elect a government, nobody can assume for them or seek to force... But Mr. Noja, you are not, not particularly answering the question. My, my apologies. You are not particularly, you know, speaking to the issue. Well, my you question, said the question... We're not, we're the, not the, jittery the, about it. Okay, so you said you will not use the word jittery. So it's what not word... Jittery, it's considered. Okay. And consequently, um, but you also admitted that some people who belong to the voting bloc that always favored the PDP hitherto seem to have gone to the Labour Party. That's what you just said now. Yeah, well, well, I can also say to this, I can also speak to this and say that there were people who would have voted for APC who have made up their minds to vote for our president. Well, incidentally, the APC is not on this panel there. to speak it's to that for or against. But let me ask uh, Mr. Okay. Okubi the I same question. Let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. Okay. Let me rephrase that. There are people who would have voted for other candidates who are making the choice to vote for our, our candidates. Mm. There has to be the exercise, and we, we recognize that as the People's Democratic Party. Mm. Well, you have, just, you have only just confirmed, Mr. Right. Onoja, just one second. You've only just confirmed willy-nilly um, uh, the conversation that we had with a representative of the Labour Party last week who said about 85% of uh, PDP's voting bloc is moving to the, to the Labour Party. That's why I asked if... Uh, the concern, or rather, maybe I should put it this way. How serious is that concern for the PDP? That's for you, Mr. Onoja. This is an election where, uh, this will be an election where every vote counts. The loss of one vote from anywhere is any political party that does not consider seriously the loss of any vote in an election where every vote counts it's not, to my mind, serious about winning an election. And so, again, I will restate, we're considerate about it. We're not jittery about it because you want as many people to vote for you as possible. And it's really just, it's not about whether we're fighting vote splitting. We're going across the country, we're speaking to people of every, every, of every possible demographic. And we're knowing that, okay, so... We, um, there are a couple of candidates who have left with Mr. Peter Obi. I mean, a couple of, of voters who probably have left with Mr. Peter Obi. It doesn't change the fact that they have also been there. Also, millions of voters who have come to, who have made up their mind to vote for PDP, either newly because they're just coming of age and they realize that in this first election, this is the person who is speaking the most about solutions, or people who are returnee voters who didn't vote for PDP in 2019 or in 2015, and who have made up their minds to vote for PDP now. And anybody who says that it is not a, there is not a loss and gain, it's not doing a, um, a proper assessment of the Nigerian sociopolitical space. Okay. Well, Mr. Wokobia, uh, let me ask you the same question, perhaps a little differently. That same uh, spokesperson of the PDP also said that, uh, you know, the, the, your, your candidate cannot make it. 
For instance, he said the Liberal Party only fielded 30 out of 109 candidates for the Senate. Who is going to protect the votes of the Liberal Party when even fielding candidates for 109 senatorial seats, they couldn't? And that any vote for your candidates is a vote for another party altogether. How do you respond? Let me say, oftentimes when you look at what's happening on our political demography and political kaleidoscope, you, you understand the fact that those who are talking about structures and those who are talking about, they've lost team because what we have is a sweltering hamatan of popular discontent with the Leviathan, the APC, and the Behemoth, the PDP. Nigerians are increasingly uh, identifying with the new urgency, the call for a new day, and the call for a new tendency in leadership. And so um, it is about Labour Party and the movement is about a new deal. It's about a movement that is interested in taking back our country for good. And that is why the candidate that resonates the most, you've had about six, seven polls regarding the 2023 election. And five out of six of the polls have given it to uh, Peter Gregory will be only one uh, gave it to Bola Metinubu and with a caveat that the Nigerian people may uh, disapprove of his victory should he win. The reason I use the word when Peter Gregory will be wins is because he's the only candidate that resonates across the six geopolitical zones of the country. And then interestingly, the new raging demography of voters, uh, you've heard the INEC statistics, puts the, uh, the number of people, new registrants, uh, at 40% young people. And you know, you and I know, and, and this is about truth and uh, unequivocal reality. Answering the question that more I than asked 80% you, of just, that just, just a second, just a second. Vote Peter Gregory will be. You are not particularly and speaking to the issue. Just one second, uh, Mr. Awokowe, if you can hear me. If you can hear me, just one second. You are not particularly speaking to the issue that I've asked you. And the question is pretty simple. Is the plan of the Labour Party to deplete the votes of the PDP as alleged by the PDP? Is it true that, you know, Labour Party is just playing a game because really the Labour Party cannot make it, fielding only 30 out of 109 candidates, according to that same candidate, the spokesperson of the other candidates? So that's the question that I'm asking you. Can you speak to it directly? Let me say, and that's the, question, the answer I was trying to, uh, I was driving the vehicle to that point. For the PDP alleging that uh, the Labour Party wants to uh, split its vote, that's absolutely untrue because, like I said, there's a raging fervency, there's an urgency, there's a sweltering hammer calling for a new day. Nigerians are saying that they want a new tendency away from the Leviathan, the APC, and the Behemoth, the PDP. They, they, they call for, for a new Republican leadership, for a new day and a new deal. It's about uh, the Labour Party and Peter Gregory will be. So it is not necessarily about how many candidates have been fielded at different levels by Labour Party. It's about the urgency and the fervency of now. And let me, that's actually why I was driving the vehicle. In Malawi, uh, the issues were the same. In Kenya, the issues were the same. In Lesotho, the issues were the same. In Zambia, people called those who sought to etch a new deal on their collective political kaleidoscope, uh, social media leaders, social media presidents. But you know what? Like it happened in the 1950s and 1960s, within that period, about 24 countries across the world, Asia, South America, and Africa, got independence because there was a fervency, a universal fervency calling for independence. As you and I talk, nations are rising up to take back their destinies and make their countries responsible and responsive to the people. And that's what's happening. It's happened in Lesotho, it happened in Zambia, it's happened in Kenya, and it will happen here because the masses of our people have risen to the urgency of now. And they are saying that the time to take back our country is now. Okay, and the man so, at the fore yeah. of that movement is Peter Gregory Obi. To if speak I to may, the question, just, very, very briefly, uh, to speak to the question and to speak to the point, you cannot discountenance the number of candidates that are, pre are presented across 
across the country. You so cannot I, I was just going to ask you. I mean, I, I have I, I'd to like question. to make that point. Yes, like just a point. moment, yeah. and, and it will be around that particular yeah, issue. So um, I'm, I'm going to be asking both of you, even though it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be, will I say, written differently or said differently. Your party is still, you know, trying to pull itself together. Uh, we understand that five of the governors who um, are still, you know, in protest against uh, the, well, let's like say against the emergence of your party, or asking that there be fairness within your party and asking the national chairman to step down so that there will be equity, uh, are going ahead to run the campaigns for, you know, for their members who are going to be running for um, different positions, even with, within the party still. How do you think that these divisions is going to affect uh, the chances of your candidate come 2023? I would respond to that by saying two things. One, there is a desire within every member of the People's Democratic Party to see that situation resolved as, as quickly as possible. It's taken far too long. And to the minds of many of us, it has been a distraction. There's that desire. However, there's also the desire to continually commit, communicate with Nigerian people and the realization that we can do <laughs> A me. and B at the same time. There is, a, there is a recognition of the uh, of their disagreement. There's a recognition of that. And PDP historically has always been a party where this sort of disagreement have always been permitted. We're not one party where one person sits down and controls everybody. You say yeah? it's gone on for far too long. It, it, so do it, you think now that, that you know, it, it, it's it doesn't beyond, change. It's beyond resolution? I, I don't believe that. That door is permanently open. That door is permanently open. And it doesn't change the fact that the party still appeals to a lot of people, to millions of Nigerians across the country, doesn't change the fact that the party is still campaigning to millions of people across the country and doesn't change the fact that the party is still speaking to the sorts of policies that will be solutions to Nigeria's problems. You can do that while you constantly leave a door open for reconciliation and um, negotiation. The good thing about it is that on every side, even on the sides of the five governors, they still maintain to you that that door is open. They still maintain to you that there is a commitment to the People's Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. that, that, and that goes without saying. I think sometimes we really actually just need to focus. And this is where the media needs to help us. While we're doing all that, and, this is, and when I say us, I don't mean the political party, I mean Nigerians. While we're doing all that, while all that interest between the political interest conversation between the political um, classes going on, the Nigerian people have to focus on their own conversation. Who is going to help us create jobs? Who is going to help us resolve our insecurity? Who is going to give us better access to education? Who is going to give us better access to healthcare? Who is going to resolve particularly I youth think, unemployment? I think you must remember, we can do you, these you must two remember things at that the, same the people time. who we're talking about here are leaders in their own capacity. And I recognize they, that. They lead states as we currently speak. And they, they, certain, they certainly have a following. And the following that they have, they're not Nigerians, they're Nigerians. And I will but, say this. And yeah. I will say this. It Excuse is me. in recognition of the fact that every, mem every Nigerian has that constitutional right to one vote, that you can be talking to the leader and to the follower at the same time. Fair enough. So let me come to you. Your party, I mean, one of the things I also took away from the conversation I had with the director general of the campaign is that you haven't shut the door of negotiations with sure. even parties like the NNPP, sure. uh, which it seemed like uh, there was going to be no negotiations or negotiations that totally failed initially uh, but it looks like you're beginning to realize that you would need the collaboration of many other candidates on this particular journey um how is that coming along and and how are you you know making yourself marketable towards them in such a way that you can accommodate them if nobody's really willing to step down for the other consistently there's a candidate who has referred to every candidate in the campaign as his brother. There's a candidate who has reached out to everyone as uh, someone, um, he has talked about Artiko as someone he respects, about Bola Timbu as his elder brother, he's talked about Kwakwansu as a friend and his brother. There is this commitment to national uh, uh, rebat that P2B has. It's a bit 
of a wonderment to some of us. He, he believes that we must all work together to bet a new day. He believes that we must all work together to, to redeem and take back our country. And when you're dealing with the behemoth, permit my choice of word again, uh, the PDP that was in power for 16 years, and you're dealing with the Leviathan that's been in power for about seven years, going to eight, you need to work with other tendencies to, to, to take them out of power. And there is a raging, a raging fervency that's put Peter over your head. So what are we doing? We're looking at how we co-opt our brothers like Shore, our brothers like uh, uh, Kwapanso, our brothers like Kola Biol and, and the likes into a rainbow coalition that will take back our country for good. And it is imperative that we do so. Because is, is that resonating amongst your followers? It does. And, and that's exactly what I'm saying. That there is uh, the obedient movement and indeed the Labour Party and our principal are looking at this rainbow coalition. Because whether we like it or not, after 23 years of failure, after 23 years of no light, after 23 years of joblessness, after 23 years of asset strike, and I'm talking about... Uh, a situation that existed between the PDP and the APC, that's the Siamese twins, you need a new tendency in leadership. And that's what I, uh, Labour Party, Peter Gregory will be, the obedient movement, and the other parties that are saying that it is time for a new day are pushing. So we're talking with every tendency because we believe that come February 2023, we must take back our country for good, we must redefine the values and leadership, and we must make leaders who are responsible and responsive to the people to emerge on so our political agenda. So if I hear you theater. clearly, just a moment, you'll have your say. If I hear you clearly, you're partnering with everybody else apart from those within the PDP and APC. Largely apart from those who have brought this country to the sorry past. Uh, apart from those who have brought our country to the nada, that, Apart from those who stole a moment, our just collective Just world, a moment, how possible uh, is that knowing that your candidate also left the PDP? And perhaps you also have How long was he then in the PDP? He went into the PDP he because he year. thought... No, but how long was he there? He went into the PDP because he thought that it was time to take inclusive of everybody who thinks about the New Day to the mainstream of Nigerian politics. Okay. And when he found out that we, corruption was at the core of the values in leadership in the PDP, when he found out that uh, vote buying was about the, the normative for the PDP primaries, he stepped out. Okay. The we issues have, are you, simply... You had your say. We, have to, we have to. Yeah. We have to reject these sorts of rhetorics that have no steeping in reality. We but have to reject truth. them. And I will tell you, but that's Peter truth. Obi not only was the vice presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party mm -hmm. in 2019, during which time he said fantastically glowing things about um, our presidential candidate, Alaji Atikwa Baka. He served in the government of uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan as a special advisor on economic affairs and leader of an economic team. If you're going to sit down here and say to us, oh, PDP and all this time and its failures, what you have to admit is that Peter is one of two things. It's either you're not telling us the truth now or you're admitting to us as Nigerians that Peter will be contributed to those failures. The whole you know, no, 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 hold on, can I finish? I kept quiet and I waited for you to finish. I waited for you to finish. I waited for you to finish. Passion. You cannot say to us that you were a, an economic advisor in a, for a party that during its 16 years in government averaged 7% um, GDP growth every year. You cannot say for 16 years, average 7% so GDP was growth. Hold on, five years, hold on, you know, you know, five years. Less that, than five that years. And it moved on for is, a new tendency and passion. I will even tell you how far that statistic mm. went. Mm. That mm. President Muhammad Buhari, on February 1st, 2014, speaking at the Chatham House, quoted the particular statistic mm -hmm. that on the average, PDP grew the economy 7% a year between 1999 and 2015. Yes. He went ahead to call it paper growth. Let just, me finish, please. No, just a Can moment, I finish, Just please? a moment, just a moment. I mean, while averages are allowed, um, and, and, you know, it is okay for us to quote averages, it might be misleading. Uh, because if you look at the fact that in 2002, uh, you had the biggest growth ever seen, 12, beg your pardon, 15.3%. Yeah. I would like to speak to that. Yeah, just a moment. 15.3%. If you were to, you know, put that in, in terms of average, that certainly will help all the other years and might mask 
uh, what the real growth rate was. And even at that, remember that for many years, part of the conversation was the whether or not there was you know, growth that came with employment, et cetera. You know, sure. what exactly was responsible for that I would, growth? I would like to... But, I, you know, just, like just to make quickly... The point. I just to quickly I, put that on, you know... I would like to finish the point then, yes. having taken that into consideration. Yes. And I'd like to speak to that. In 1999, growth... You can quickly fact-check me. Mm -hmm. 1999, growth year-on-year year was 0.6%. Mm -hmm. The next year, if I'm not mistaken, it was 5.6% mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Yeah. In 2022... It was 15%. 2002. In 2002, sorry. Yeah. It was 15%. Yeah. The chairman, the vice president, and the chairman of the National Economic Forum at the time, Alaji Atikwa Baka, the same sort of place where we are, with the same sort of promise for the same sort of delivery. This is, and this is you pulling up these numbers now, mm -hmm. this is testament to the ability that he has to deliver on a previously like fact, unseen I like scale. the fact that you emphasize the 15.3%. But I will go ahead. After the that, following year, you now had 7%. Seven, seven yes, which was at least half. So but it was oh, oh, yes, a major drop. If you consider yeah. that you haven't had 7% growth between, 19, um, between 2015... There are many factors and, uh, responsible. No, and these factors, yeah. these factors are all... Taking these factors that are present now were present between 1999 and 2003. Gentlemen, they were present then. I wish we could go on and on. Politics is always an interesting mm -hmm, discussion. But let me steal in this. No, we're totally out of time, gentlemen. <laughs> let me steal I in have this, to please. I have to wrap this up now. I'm so sorry. We're totally out of time. And I thank both of you uh, for being, will I well, say, gentlemanly. How the PDP just a moment, for, the for, being, for being very gentlemanly in terms of how you have conducted your conversation. Thank you so much uh, for well. coming on Sunrise Early this morning. Ilemona Onoja is a member of the People's Democratic Party. You've heard how passionately he's spoken uh, for the candidate of the party. And also Mr. Chris Wonkobia Jr., member of Dati Presidential Campaign Council. You've also heard him. Uh, speaking passionate, almost ending every statement with Peter Gregory will be. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. Well, we'll take a break at this point, and we'll be back with another part, uh, well, another aspect of politics, maybe this time around the economy. Why don't you stay tuned? Please stay with us. Exactly what we're looking at, the twists and turns in Afenifer, of course, for those who have been following the story, has been a yes or no back and forth here and there. Well, let's just get into the conversation straight away with the two gentlemen that you have seen on your screen. Uh, uh, Buega Adejumo is an Afenifer chieftain. Thank you so much for being here. It's good to be back here again. As well as Biodu Shoumi, a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm pleased to be here. Good morning. L let me start with you, sir. Um, all of that, should I say, confusion in the media, uh, there are those who are wondering exactly what is, should, is this something that's, that, that should happen? Someone endorsing, someone endorsing, exactly what's the backstory? Well, it's the season, we are in that season where everything goes um, out there. If there's going to be anything at all, maybe the absence of uh, okay. uh, is a season of fake endorsements. A season of fake endorsements. Okay. I'm serious. Okay. About fake we'll, we'll, we'll come to you. We'll come back to you. You know, very quickly. Uh, but there are those who are wondering if all of that confusion was necessary in the first place. I mean, the history of Afeni Ferry is not unknown. It's always been, uh, should I say? politically sensitive or, you know, sentimental, you know, organization over the years. So this back and forth, do you, did you see it as something to worry about or it's just one of those things? No, oh, absolutely. Um, it's quite very worrisome. Um, when you look at Afeni Ferry, historically speaking, Afeni Ferry has a way of resolving its differences within its own fold without necessarily allowing it to degenerate into leaders squaring up against each other, one holding one position, the other holding a different position, in a situation where decisions being taken particularly um, by one of the factions, Representative uh, Siesmisk 
you know, shift in the way Afeni Ferry operates. Afeni Ferry, with no pretense, uh, no apology, it's purely a Yoruba sociocultural political organization uh, established the, the, you know, you for say, the promotion. When, when, when you say factions, it raises a question yeah. then. There was, there was no faction in this matter. Well, that is absolutely wrong. There are different perspectives on this matter, which is you can't deny that. So let, let him, let, let let him speak. Anything. Okay. I'm just trying to set the record straight. It's yeah. an organization I've been for, for, for about 20 years. What, what happened was not about the faction. Who, okay, who is the factional leader here now? Let's face it. Those who, are, who congregated in Abu, in, in Akure, how many of them are family members? In which case, we have eight chapters. In fact, let me even say nine. Because we have uh, an ESCO even in Delta State, led by Olupesu. But the eight chapters that people will refer to, inclusive of Kwara and Kogi, none of the state chairmen were there. Okay. It, it, yeah. So come in, please. Okay, no, pardon me. Pardon me. We, we need to sort something technically. So where's the fashion? Mogaji, we need to sort something technically. So let's give a lot of people the backstory to this, then we'll come back. Because I know a lot of water has gone under the bridge, but so you would understand the context of this conversation we're having. Let's watch this and we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> First, a hearty reception for the candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC Bola Hakmet Tinubu, and his entourage. <laughs> the candidate is on a mission to get the blessing of the pan Yoruba social political group at Feni Ferry. Ends the visit to the residence of the 96 year old Ruben Fashanroti, the leader of the group. Before the commencement of the event, the candidate gets his wish at the residence of Pa Fashanroti in his living room in Nakure. <laughs> Proceeded to the main event where the newly elected governor of Ikiti State, Biodun Yebanji, Yoruba elders, Chief Olufalaye, Chief Bisi Akonde, General Lani Akinri Nade, and others were present. The group wants the candidate to look into the pending issue of restructuring. If you look very carefully, and I know you should have known this, even those who are opposing restructuring are already asking for it crying for it, or trying to implement it. Restructuring is very cutting in this So some, some context. Let's continue our conversation. We still have Magaji Boyega Adejima, who's an Fenifer chieftain, and Mr. Biodon Shomi, a public affairs analyst. So you were trying to explain, because a lot of people saw uh, Chief Fashionati there, praying, blessing the candidate of the APC. And then there was another video that emerged later saying, that, well, you people have seen the trend. I am socially uh, supporting uh, Jagaban. And that's that, that um, visual we saw afterwards. And then they've seen what played out before now, uh, Chief Adibanjo endorsing a Labour Party candidate and again doing that. So is Afeniferi obedient, for the lack of a better term, today? Afeniferi is fully obedient. Uh, nothing has changed. What has changed? What, what happened in Akure ought not to happen. But it's, it's the season. It's the season where people go and procure, uh, obtain, perhaps even, if we may use the word, um, foul play comes into play. And we've seen quite a slew of fake endorsements. Uh, the Olu of Wari came out and said, no, I didn't endorse him. Uh, then, of course, um, the cardinals, the bishops, uh, the Catholic Church said, we didn't endorse him. The OPC, Ghani Adam said, I didn't endorse him. But then uh, many things had been put out as if they had gotten certain endorsements. And what happened in Akure was a farce, a joke. 
Um, and I will explain. W would you say Chief Fashionati was part of a farce? He wasn't job? part of it. It no, was. We, we it saw was, him there laying I, his I will hands explain and that. The visuals I will explain that. A WhatsApp group called Conscience of Yoruba Nation uh, put out an invitation signed by two people. One, an executive of Afeni Ferry, but he didn't put out this information. He didn't put out this invitation in the name of Afeni Ferry and by Dari Babani, sir. And they said, we are inviting Yoruba leaders. No, Af no word like Afeni Ferry appeared on that invitation. They are free to do so. And then, of course, they all converged in Akure. Somehow, from conscience of Yoruba nation to bringing certain people in Yoruba land together, and you begin to query the process. But then, why would you even want to deny anyone the right of gathering? Then the next thing is you are coming out to say Afeni Ferry has endorsed. Who are the people there that are Afeni Ferry? So Chief Fashionati is no more in Afeni Ferry. Chief Fashionati, he's our leader emeritus and we respect him. We revive him. His next birthday is going to be 97. He actually puts a call through to Papa Debajo to say, uh, but I met him in got across to me to say he would like to come and see me. And he asked a question. Do I receive him or not? And Papa Deban just said, please go ahead and receive him. But let him know that Ferry Ferry has taken a position. And then Chief Hashanti, uh, sorry, Chief uh, Deban went ahead to call the chair of Ondo Ferry Ferry chapter, uh, Honorable Dayo Duile, I've just had this conversation with the leader emeritus. And he did the same thing with uh, Chief Olufalai. And that is what we thought it was. Played up. Why until there when these calls until, were made, by until the way? those who wanted to do exactly um, what we will call revisionism, uh, perhaps the reactivation of the demo in certain people, the spirit of the 1962 crisis of the Ferry, decided that they were going to turn what was going to be a conscience of Yoruba nation thing into an Ferry thing. I would like to come to Mr. Shomi, but before that, just to get the facts there, because in the interview that Chief Ashurance granted after that, he said categorically, and this is on record, that I didn't call him, he didn't call me referring to Chief Adebanjo, and he said that we never spoke about the visit, but you said that a certain call <coughs> was made before that visit. Were you there? Did you see that call happen? Because he said he didn't call him and he didn't even exchange I'm here to tell the truth. The only thing I have is the truth. And is that weapon as well as that shield? The truth will shield you. And then it's that same weapon that you will put out in such a way that when anything is to be said, you can only refer to the truth of the matter as it happened, in situ. What I have said to you today is the gospel truth. Were you there when the call was made? I will tell you that I was privy even to that information, and I was privy even to that conversation. So you were there when the The first thing that, that happened was, was in sequence. No, no, you didn't answer me, pardon me, Mogaji. Were you there when that call I was made? I said I was there in situ. What does that mean? You were there I was when there the call present was made. and I heard. You see, there's hardly anything that goes on with this sort of a thing that will not have a witness about how it happened. So indeed. The very first, uh, the very first uh, uh, telephone conversation came from Papa Fashionati. And Papa Banjo had not even woken up. It was a missed call that. Uh, uh, the leader, Papa De Banjo, now reacted to. But as at the time that he was reacting to it, it was afternoon and some of us were there. Also, oh, after the visit had been made was when he returned the call, is that what you're saying? He returned the call and this conversation 
occurred. Just the sequence, yep. the way her so Mr. Show, we, we've seen uh, Chief Fasher saying that he didn't call him. They didn't exchange well, any information. Uh, look, what is that. clear is that Mogadi is giving a distorted version of what is going on inside that Ferry. And you sit down right here looking at everybody saying, oh, uh, I'm here to speak the truth. Now, let me tell you, let, like, let, like let us say what, act, what is actually going on. The first issue is not about Obi. It's about the issue of Ohani Ferry. When, what of did course, call, did say, Ohani like, Ferry, Ohani Ferry, what, what's on, Ohani that's Ferry. a merger Ohani between Ferry. forming an umbrella organization between Afeni Ferry and Ohanese, is which is a, called is Ohani thing, Ferry, Ohani Ferry. Is that the Look, I was part of the handshake across the Niger. Myself, Yinka Odumaki, and so many others, we worked on that project, and I'm sure you were not there. And I know that you are even had the seven years within Afeni Ferry. I know that for, for a fact. So you cannot sit here and be saying these things right in my presence. Excuse now, me. Now, for instance, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. For instance, the issue is about consultation. Chief Ayoade Banjo has not been carrying other leaders along. That is the cross of the matter. Yes, everybody, the entire Feniferi leadership knew that there were some discussions on Anchek across the Niger, which involves the Middle Bed Forum, involves Ohanese. And they were expected, including Pandem, they were expected to come back with the decision. When was this handshake? Oh, that has been going on for some years now, How about three, it? four years, about two years, two it's years, about two years. Two years. About two years. I was there. Years. I went to Enugu. No, no, not up to that. I went, I was in Enugu. We had another one in Middle Belt. Meetings have been going on. No, 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 no. Don't come with what you don't know. You, you, now, you the, fact is, the fact is, the fact is, that, that, is that, that, that is the problem. Down. That is the you cause of the problem. Have your time to Lack of consultation by Papa Ayuadi Banjo is the major problem. He took that decision and they announced jointly, you know, and Ambassador Jiaku and so many other people are alive to attest to the fact that they did form Ohani Ferry. They went to the press with it, and many people were uncomfortable with that process. Uh, you have not consulted with the leaders. They have not sought any approval or whatsoever. That was there. And Papa Yuadibanjo happens to be an acting leader. He was never made substantive leader of Ohani Ferry. Solely appointed by uh, Papa your first one. Does that remove the fact that he's still leader anyway? He's a leader. He's one of the leaders. What he the is leaders not or the leader. He's a leader. He's not the only leader. General Kenyatta is a leader. Uh, oh, Shende, uh, uh, Shende, oh, when did you? What did you know about these things? Shende, Arubafa, for instance, you were saying eight chapters Can of Afen Ferry, and you mentioned them. And you said the hate one was Delta, right? What about uh, Afeni Ferry in Sorry, Europe? What do you know about that? Are you saying Afeni Ferry? Right? Yes. What Afeni do you know about that? So it's not yes, eight. It's night. not eight. It's actually ten. Can, so can I, can it's, it's actually ten. And I can, I can mention all the chapters the, to let's you. Let's speak the facts. The Who fact of the matter is... is the leader of Afeni Ferry? Let's, let's get the facts. Chief right. Ruben Papa Ruben Fasoronti is the leader. But he's since handed over and he said it clearly. In an acting capacity. So does that mean that there are two leaders of Afeni Ferry? There are so many leaders of Afeni Ferry, How can they including have state so chapter leaders. leaders. But pa that is pa pa that Fashion Roti yeah. only mentioned Papa Adibanjo as leader, not other leaders. No, you know Afeni Ferry has so many shiftings. You know, you have the states. Even chapters. in acting capacity, that in even, acting capacity. even even in an yes. acting capacity, you only mentioned one person. Oh, absolutely, because he appointed him. He made him acting leader at a point in time when he was so vulnerable, he lost his daughter, he was so vulnerable, he needed, you he know, to step aside. He needed to that step was after aside. He over. He, he then handed over. No, yeah. that, so, I mean, those in are an acting capacity. Events, the but that does not. was in 2019. Yes. And the loss was after. No, Papa Debajo did not become... Uh, in 2019, he was not the acting president, acting leader of Afeni Ferry. In what? 2019? Um, Mogaji. Can I explain all of this? In 2019, no. Because he's given, been given a lot of time. No. First and foremost, Papa Fashion has lost his daughter in the year 2020. What Papa Fashion did in the year 2021 was to react to what would have been an insurgence within the Afeni Ferry. Some people actually claim that Papa was going senile and they wanted to move. So it was a year and after he lost It was a year daughter. after that. That's a and then he now came and said, I must make sure 
that I stop what some people are trying to do and I will now make my exit, but I will want to leave Afeniferi in good hands. In that letter that he wrote, he said Papade Banjo is synonymous with Afeniferi. He said Papade Banjo is synonymous with Afeniferi. He praised him for having been there right from 1951. And he said Papade Banjo is going to now be the acting leader and Oba Oladipo Olaiton is going to be the deputy leader. And he now enjoins every member of Afeniferi to give them the kind of support that they gave to him. And the last paragraph in that letter said, I will remain an Afeniferi until I die. He never said, he never wrote on that letter that I will remain the Afeniferi leader until I die. He said, I will remain an Afeniferi. You guys should have a copy of the letter and show it to the world if what I have said is wrong. And I think now, even now, after now, that now, now I must come just, back just to, to the misconception context. and what I will call an outright deliberate attempt to change the story about Afeniferi. I must say it here. You are not a member. If you're a member, then of course you won't come here and so this kind of uh, uh, seed of mistrust, of discord. There was never a merger. There is Ohaniferi, all right. It's a group that exists between <laughs> Afeniferi and Ohanese. And it is just a way, a meeting point. What we decided to do was very simple. You see, we've had issues in the past where all that happened in 1962 to 1966 uh, became a matter of those who tended to go towards the north, Akintola and the rest of them. And they formed the demo group, the demo party. And then we had those who decided with Awolowo himself as the one who instigated it, who would go with the east, and that was the Opga. And that scenario has continued to manifest one way or the other within Afeniferi. The letter of resignation that Papa Wola tendered uh, to, to um, sorry, not the letter of resignation, the letter that he wrote to uh, Agui Ronzi uh, for pardon, state pardon, he said it that on the eve of his uh, going to jail, um, the Chief Justice of the Federation then sent Alaji Elias to him and said, mm -hmm. if you will renounce your association with Okpara of the NCNC, you won't go to jail. It's there in that letter. Okay. I didn't well, make it up. The I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. This. The relevance of all this is that there had always been those who want to feel that we sh the Avenue should tilt towards that school of thought. And there are always those who feel that our law was said expressly, uh, and even Professor Akintoye said so. Well, now, I'm coming, uh, that we should we're running have, out of time we should so have that we can a, a better understanding, yes. I'm coming, with, with the Igbos. Okay. Now, it, I'm sorry, I, I want to come down to something that you said. I know General Akintoye they have slept in his house. But when last did General Akinyade attend any meeting of the Affairs Well, you've not See, spoken to by the, the time, by the time Papa was he made, made a point, I'm coming, pardon me, I'm coming. I'm because of time, I'm sorry, we need I have to, to deal I have with to, this. I have to set this he straight. talked about Chief Adebanjo, and he talked about his leadership style, not consulting. And I'd that like is, you to that speak is not to true. That. Exactly. So speak that to is that. not true. The process of arriving at where we are going actually started in 2017. He said a lot of things that I need to correct. When we started in 2017, we went to Adama Singa. We formed a group of 42 other Yoruba groups, and we called it the Yoruba Summit Group. I was, and still is, the publicity secretary of, of Yoruba Summit Group that went to Adama Singa to declare that it is restructuring or nothing. That was on that day that the Southern Middle Belt Forum was formed. Okay. We, are, we, 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 we came to the conclusion that we must now invite 
other groups so that they can come and see with us so that we can press on restructuring. So we invited Pandev. We, we, the two, we, the two, we, I'm coming. We, we, we're running out of time. I, I know you want to respond to a number mm. of things, but just make this clear so that you know, we, can, we can have value for our, the rest of the time. How salient is it that a group must endorse a candidate for the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Yes, and why sir. is it an issue? It's absolutely, you know, uh, not very important. The, what's important is the voters. Those who vote are the primary constituency when it comes to election, not subgroups. The only area where you see, you know, it makes you look good, you feel endorsed, you feel acceptable. That is why you have what Chief Ayodibanjo did by presenting, because he has been backing Obi for a long time. We know his position right from these discussions about handshake across Niger, you know, and it's very, very clear what they did. He did not submit the decision, you know, he did not consult other leaders or get other leaders other to leaders ratify the very position true. either on Obi or on Other or leaders, or right. it's other leaders in Afeniferi. In Afeniferi, right? yes. Like other chief did, Oh, so many of them. Shende Arobofa is there. You know, he was the past general secretary. There are so many of them. He's not the only one. Koli Omolulu, the national uh, organizing secretary of Afeniferi, is there. Sholala Wali, there. there are so the many of them. Is Sholala a member of the... Is Sholala Wali not a member of Afeniferi? He's not a member. Oh, no, you are joking. Uh, you, then you don't me. know the Excuse history no, of no, Afeniferi. Let's speak to Sholala Just a second. Let's speak to that. No, please. Just a second. Just a second. Mogaji, Mogaji, we are running out of time. For five years, I was going to Undo for... Mogaji, we are running I out of time. The, the, the issue, just the a only second, gentlemen, I was seeing John gentlemen, was in the the issue, the issue is Chief Ayadibanjo not please, consulting please. with other leaders. We have to go, so, gentlemen, so, just a second, so, Mogaji, we have to go. Just, was, just a second, Mogaji, Mogaji, allow us to have this conversation the way it ought to go. Please answer the question that I asked him as well. Mogaji, 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 Please ask, answer the same question that I asked him. How salient, how important is it for a group like Afeniferi to endorse a presidential candidate? I think it's important to those who have formed parallel Afeniferi. When Papa Fashionati was made the leader of Afeniferi, Tinumbu and his type and the others, they went and made Papa Ayo Fasomi the leader of Afeniferi. They created a parallel. After Papa Fasomi died, they made B. Dudrojaye their own leader. They actually went to Asorok in 2019 under the name of the same Afeniferi. But of course, not, you, not, you, not you Baba, said not, here not, the other time. I'm coming, please. You said Baba the Fashomi. other time, uh, uh, Mogaji, that Afeniferi is not divided. That's what I'm saying. They created their own parallel in such a way as to say, oh, this is the Afeniferi we belong to. But, but is that the, to say the, that the, those the, who are, who are, who are, the, who are had, aligned with this thing, coming, this I'm claim that you're making, if, if, just if, a second, if, is yes. that to say that those people who aligned with this other, you know, parallel that you talk about, they're not members of Afeniferi? If they had gone away, left the fold, picked somebody else, and said they are no part of the fashion of the Banjo, Afeniferi, then what are they doing coming back? Okay, Mr. Shomi, lastly, if, do, are you saying also that Afeniferi is divided? No, what we have is um, a leadership that is not consulting with other chieftains of Afeniferi, not carrying people along. You know, Papa Yuadibanjo goes around, does his own thing, and expect every so other person to follow along. So you are saying that the, the, the group is not divided? The, the group, technically, the group is not divided because the leader is still Papa Fasuranti. That endorsed Tinumbu. So do you agree that, in Akure? that Afeniferi is obedient, as he said? Oh, Afeniferi, how come Afeniferi be obedient? Come on. Papa Yuadibanjo well, is obedient. It's not divided. It's not divided. Is Papa Yuadibanjo is obedient. No doubt about it. But he Mangaji is, is obedient. Okay. Mangaji is obedient. There is only a handful of them. He's, 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 he's only a handful. He's only a handful. I can count I can count them. Let me answer. It's just a handful. What they had, what they and had, those are the people they, had in they are con con consulting with. Please, I you know, know well, gentlemen, we, we really have to just say that. I must answer him. We have come. You cannot arrogate, refuse to consult none of the state chapter chairmen. 
inclusive of the Undo State Chairman, was there. Well, is that to say that members of Afeni Ferry were not in accord with Pastor I'm telling you, Olu Falai was there. Okay. General Lubajoma was there. What? Gentlemen, you we have to go. We have to go. We have to go. We have to go. So we have to say thank you to you, uh, Mogadji. And you can Kuega, excuse me. Adjibo. We really the have chair, to go, No, please. He is, he's making it look as if he knows everything. But it does not. Let know me let me believe that we will exactly continue this conversation after the after the after structure of Afeni really Ferry. The meeting of Afeni Ferry has been happening yes. in Obo. Yes. And the last thing Baba Fashionati said we, we is have that to close I now. never said Chief Ayuade Banjo is no more the acting leader. We, we really and have to go there to and, and, We really and, have and to go there to time. And he said meetings would not happen in an Afeni Ferry chieftain and Mr. Biodun Shomi is a public affairs analyst. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a part of our conversation this morning. Well, um, we really have to go. We have to thank you very much for the privilege of being a part of your morning this morning. Thank you so much for your messages as well. I'm Ayo Makini. Have a wonderful day. Well, quite a number of them, but as you've seen, it's a very interesting conversation. It mm -hmm. continues in the coming days. But don't forget the focus. It's on Nigeria, making our nation the very best. I'm Kairi Okikilu. Have a fantastic day ahead. Thank you. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf, wishing you a very productive week.